guys welcome back to conspiracy normal it's uh, it's good to be back tonight guys we uh, we've got a special treat because we have a guest that we haven't had on in quite a while it's been i think maybe four years maybe something like that although uh, i have definitely interacted with this gentleman since then but uh, that is uh, mr greg bishop greg welcome back to the show man hey guys how's it going it is going well oh, good it is going well mr radio mysterioso that's right i've got about uh, six shows ready to go i just haven't released them yet because i'm so damned lazy so there'll be well, shows on radio mysterioso coming up everybody's wondering where where radio mysterioso has been i've been doing interviews with people i've got like i said i've got six interviews sitting there just in the can and um one of them's the last interview with david perkins because i went to his house yeah and wow. talked to him for like an hour and a half or something. That's all he could take because he was so weak. Um, he just let's let's do one last interview. I said, David, don't don't say that. Come on, I'll just see you in a few months. And it was a last interview. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I mean, there's nothing in there. It's like, oh my God, he's that's he's never admitted that before. He basically reiterated what he said mm-hmm. and said, I don't know what's going on. I think it has something to do with the uh, planetary consciousness fighting back at us that was his main idea and i think he stuck with that but he wasn't married to it he, he was yeah. one of those people that have a a specific um theory but they don't really care they don't think that's encompasses everything and there's there's a few uh, a, f- a few people that i really like to talk to that have that kind of have that attitude they got a favorite but it could change you know right well you know one of the reasons uh one of the reasons I had you on tonight, well, you kind of, we had you on really for two reasons, is that you're going to be doing the first online event coming up on April 24th for Strange Realities. Mm-hmm. Of the year. But but yeah, first online event of the year. Um, but also, too, you know, I watched not long ago the Octopus documentary that was on Netflix. I haven't seen it yet, damn it. I liked it. Um I thought it was a good documentary, but I know some people were really miffed that Ken Thomas was not mentioned at all in it. Yeah, they showed the covers book apparently, but didn't say anything about it. Yeah, yeah. I just and saw that for the did. first time today. On yeah. The- um, and and yeah, but I, I really want to. Uh, one of the things I really want to talk about tonight is like kind of your memories of really two guys. We we just talked about one, David Perkins, and Ken Thomas, and kind of like how you met them. And kind of like what some of your like key memories of them are and just how important really both of those guys like research really was to this whole community. Yeah, I guess I'll um, I'll start off with David because that's shorter. Um, Chris O'Brien introduced us probably, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. Maybe it's not even that long. It seems like that long. And he said, I think you and David should talk. You'd have a lot to talk about. And we did. I went out and visited him. I called him a couple of times, but then uh, I went up to Santa Fe and visited him. And we had a nice talk. Um, I don't think I recorded it. And then I visited him probably three or four more times. Um, The thing that fascinated me about David is, one, as I just said, he didn't have a specific idea about uh, cattle mutilations. He had one, but he wasn't married to it. Um, which interested me because that means your mind is open to other things. Um, and you can debate a little bit better because you're not <laughs> uh, you're not backed into a corner about some theory that everybody associates w- you with and you make money off of or whatever the hell. Um, which he didn't. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't making any money off the cattle mutilation thing. It was just something that interested him. He um was one of the first mutilation researchers and the I think 75 or 76 is when he started, which is ridiculous because I was a little kid then and most people probably listening weren't born, but um, it was fascinating to talk to him about what those early days were like, um, what they were finding, some of the things that he saw, you know, just like from the ridiculous to the, to the stomach churning to the everything in between you could think of with cattle mutilations. Uh, both he and Chris 
actually um, praised Linda Howe for the way she went about things at the beginning and how she did her research on cattle mutilations. Chris said something in particular, and, and David totally agreed with it. Um, a witness, especially a rancher, uh, a male rancher, will speak to a woman way differently than they speak to a male investigator. Um, and people don't really think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's extremely valuable, not only for any kind of paranormal investigation, but especially for this where it's ranchers and it's Southwest and it's a macho culture and the whole thing. So, uh, you know, a soft voice asking you questions about this extremely disturbing thing would elicit responses that, that people wouldn't normally get. Um, and David said he learned a lot from her and so did Chris. Uh, and I think he wrote a book really early on about this, uh, about cattle mutilations. I'm going to be horribly embarrassed if I get it wrong. I think the name of the book was Altered Stakes. Yep. <laughs> um, Oh, I'm right. Okay, thank you. I think you can see it in Adam's background. Actually, it's on. Yeah, it's right behind me. He oh, gave you have us one. Some, yeah, go grab it, Adam. He he gave us both a copy of the. They never gave me one, and I visited him. <laughs> Sorry, of the self-published. Uh, we just yeah. asked. We did. Yeah. <laughs> actually, really cool. I don't know. Maybe he did. I've got so many books that I might have it, but I don't remember seeing it. I mean, I've seen it, but I don't remember seeing it. I don't remember seeing it on my bookshelf. So. I never got to read it. What's in it? I mean, is it just, it, when was it published? 77, 78, something like that? I think it was later than that. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think it's the 80s. Altered States would have come out, I think, like 81. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, I guess the, the film well, popularized the phrase. It's a colloquium on the cattle mutilation question. Um, Let me see if there is a data. Yeah, 1982. Okay. Oh, okay. Pretty early, yeah. And it's all like, you know, it's, it's, it's typewritten yep. and stapled together. And it's, yeah, basically his, uh, like a, it's basically just like a bunch, it looks like it's a, like an interview or like a discussion yeah. uh, between the cattle mutilation researchers. Okay. Oh, who's in there? David and Tom, Tom Adams and. Uh, yeah. It looks there? like that. It's almost someone named Izzy. Cause it yeah, that's, like, that's David. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it's just a discuss, really a discussion between the two of them. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Tom Clark did the cover art. Is what mm -hmm. it says. A Socratic dialogue. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, there was a. Um, God, there was a. The first one was by that that um, a police officer Keith Wolverton, I think. What was the name of that book? It also had a great title. I can't remember because nobody was calling cattle mutilations that time. It was just an unexplained animal death. So they yeah. came up with their own um, uh, uh, vocabulary for it. Uh, oh, it's called Mystery Stalks the Prairie. That's a really, really rare one. Um, but as time went on, David uh, developed this uh, Gaia hypothesis because he was basically a hippie from the 1960s. So, you know, he, he, he helped start a commune that still exists. Uh, and I think his house is still there. One of his houses, he had one in Santa Fe, he was renting and one um, that he owned in, um, um, in the San Luis Valley. I can't remember what the name of the, the commune was. It wasn't Crestone. That's the name of the, one of the towns anyway. Um, and he went back and forth between those two places. Um so yeah, the last time I talked to him, he said, "Let's do another. Let's do a. Let's do a final interview, which I will post here fairly in the next few weeks." Uh, and um, he didn't really say anything. There wasn't a revelation in there or anything. It was just kind of restating what he'd already said before um, that you know that there were no explanations that the um, the mutilations tended to cluster downstream from either nuclear facilities or uh, nuclear dumps or something like that, which might have been a clue about something. Um, and uh, that, uh, yeah, and like, like I said, that the, the whole thing was he thought was the, um, the planet, the Gaia, Gaia um, <laughs> taking care of an infection, just like uh, your body does when it gets an infection, just by um, killing things or people or whatever, or getting rid of the, the cancer. So, but there's so many other things and he acknowledged them, you know, finding uh, uh, technology there and 
Um, Gabe Valdez found gas masks at one of them. And, you know, yeah. so it, it, there, there's so many different things. And if you hook onto one of them and just say, oh, well, it was the government people or it was some private or corporation or it was aliens or and you have with cattle mutilations, you have evidence for all those things, <laughs> um, including unexplained things. I asked one of the scientists at um, Bigelow at, uh, uh, at the Skinwalker that was there and they were doing research. And he said that uh, they could not decide whether to look at it from kind of almost David's point of view or a, um, I don't know what you call us, not a spiritual point of view, but more of a, a anecdotal point of view or a, or a data gathering point of view. And so they decided to use data, use data, gather data, and all their instruments would not collect anything that was usable or they would quit at the wrong time. Or, you know, all the cameras that were at this, and this has been talked about, all the cameras that were one location all pointed in another direction when something was going on, or they looked like they'd been ripped off of their um, things, including the cables. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's so many things that went on there that just confound people that were looking at it. The phenomenon um, does not want to be filmed. No, it doesn't. And uh, that self-negating thing is... is uh, present in a lot of paranormal activity, but especially cattle mutilations, UFO stuff, abductions, all that, anything associated with the UFO subject. Um, well, also cryptids. You can never yeah. get close to them. All you can get is uh, kind of a blurry, you know, somebody made a joke, it's like, well, Bigfoot must be blurry. I think it was Mitch Hedberg, who I can't stand, but he said, Bigfoot must be a blurry creature because that's all people get pictures of. And I don't think that's it. I think it is, um, it is more like, uh, it can't. You just can't. It will not conform to normal uh, 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 methods of of uh, of proof. It just won't. And the, I don't know what that reason is, except that it seems, as Belay said, it seems to react to whatever is looking at it and just like you know. And I don't think for me, I don't think it's a conscious reaction. Like, oh, I'm going to be out of the focus, or we're not going to get closer. That's just the nature of it. Like you try to take a picture of the sun, and all you get's a a spot or a, you know, it fills up the whole, whole um, uh, picture with like white light, but that's the nature of sunlight. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think sort of as an analogy about um, the catamulation thing, Bigfoot, UFOs, um, cryptids. It's just, it is not by its nature. It is not photographable by its nature. It is not um, uh, data. I mean, it's data rich, but the data doesn't make any sense. And I think it's because it's like we're using the wrong tools. We're using the tools of analysis and data and and um, deduction and uh, scientific method to figure something out that does not conform to um, a materialist viewpoint. Although I'm sure you guys have discussed this with your guests hundreds of times on your show. Oh, yeah, Absol absolutely. So I'm That's not going over, over anything new. We still love those <laughs> to answer your question about David. Hubcap on a string photos, though. The clearer they are, the more more likely they are to be faked. <laughs> In yes. fact, when people see, I mean, I I, I think Massimo uh, Teodorani, the the astrophysicist, I I mentioned this to him, and he said, you know, it's it's the clearer the picture is, the less likely it is to be um, authentic picture. And yeah. uh, Earl Gray Anderson, who you should have on your show, he's a head of Southern California MUFON and a friend of mine. He um, he's uh, he echoed something that Car Carla Turner told me in the '90s, um, which was um, she she said I think the answer to this is going to lie in anomalous details. What, what Earl says, and he's talked to hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, is that um, uh, the more the more believable the witness testimony is or the more logical it is, the less he believes it. Like if they don't come up with something completely insane somewhere in the, in, in the narrative, he's like this, the story holds too well, too well together. It does, it holds what together too well. And I don't yeah. know if I can, you know, I, 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 he tends to think, and I totally agree with him. It was nice to hear this from somebody that actually does investigation that, um, uh, the, the 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 nonsensical nature of it is kind of its authentication stamp. It needs a little high strangeness thrown in. 
Yeah, or we, we, we consider high strangeness, I think. Um, it, you know, it's kind of, kind of my, I've I kind of said what I really think about this in, in a lot of ways, that it does what it's going to do, uh, the UFO thing, cryptids, whatever, and the meaning comes from our interaction with it. It has its own meaning. It may have no meaning. It may be an existential, you know, kind of uh, thing. But when we interact with it, that's where the meaning comes in. That's where all of our mythology and all of our ideas about it and all that come from our interaction. I don't think it comes from a thing itself. Um, and that that stimulus, whatever it is, inter, you know, reacting to us. It just. I have a friend that's an anthropologist, and he said, um, "You know what happens in a lot of UFO cases? In, in, in is mimicry." Bigfoot does this too, meaning, you know, when you can't communicate with somebody or something or somebody in another language, you just start mimicking them, mm -hmm. thinking maybe that's will be that'll be the way that you can uh, communicate. So he 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 told me that he thinks there's a lot of that going on. That may be a key to it. I'm not so sure. I think the mimicry is just it. I, as I I said one time, I said. Um, I think the UFO thing is is when we get too close to it, a big mirror comes up in front of us. When so, I, I was actually talking about this. And I'll talk about Ken in a second. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say that I was talking about this with uh, Steve Stockton last night because I went on his uh, show. We were talking about the, kind of this co-creation stuff. And mm -hmm. I made the kind of the joke that, you know, why do they have to take forms that scare the shit out of us? And I wonder, you know, is there a role for fear, the fear response in the kind of co-creation um yeah, I mean it's a very strong response. Yeah, creates a lot of energy for sure. Yeah, to two, they're they're opposites on the uh, on the, the the emotion wheel, love and fear. I mean they're yeah. they're 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 both very strong, um, and they're both if you you <laughs> and people have those two feelings about the UFO thing, especially if they're having some kind of contact. They either they're they're either very positive and think you know aliens are sending them love and positive vibes and helping them out and going to help this planet, or they're just terrified and scared out of their wits. Um, sometimes it changes from one to the other. I don't know, but those teams seem to be the main reactions. I mean, humor maybe. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, sadness, but fear and love are the two probably the two strongest emotional. Uh, reactions we can have to anything and there's plenty of it in the ufo thing maybe yeah. not so much with bigfoot although i guess some researchers see researchers would beg to differ um, that makes that makes sense to me and i wonder too about some of this being um having a shamanic initiation aspect you know fear yeah. a part of that as well yeah as we would call it i don't know what the right. whatever the source of the ufo thing would call it it's just a, it, it's a, you know, it's a forced altered state, <laughs> as, as mm -hmm. you said, with a shamanic initiation, you, you yeah. don't expect it. And suddenly it's there. Josh told Josh Cutchin, I think he said this. Um, I was, uh, we both went to somewhere to see the eclipse last time, the, the full eclipse. I'm going this, this time too. Um, Where are you going to see the eclipse this time? Texas. Texas. Okay. Yes. Um, Southwestern Texas. Um, but what he said was when I went through the the um eclipse, the the, the the experience of having the sun blocked out, he said, that's the closest I think I've been to having a paranormal like a UFO sighting or a paranormal experience. If you didn't know it was coming, you would oh, crap yeah. your pants. Oh yeah. If, if people <laughs> did. I mean, you know, eclipses are seen as omens and yeah, you know. Yeah, of course. Of, of course it is, because such powerful experience right. is fear. I mean, you know. Right. So, yeah, if I didn't know it was coming, I would have thought I was going to die or it was the end of the world or whatever. I mean, if you don't, it's just it's still it's still just so awe inspiring. I mean, it's like, almost like seeing a UFO. You know, there's um, a there's a conspiracy theory right now that's making its way around um, X, you know, the former the yeah. artist formerly known as Twitter. Yeah, I'll still call it. And, Twitter, uh, yeah, they uh <laughs> People are on there saying because apparently, you know, that in these places like where you're going, they're they're expecting a ton of people to flock to where the line of totality is, and um, they're telling like that some public officials were putting out that oh, you should have like two weeks of food available, and and now you're seeing like people what? posting online and saying what are they planning? Something is happening, 
Uh, they know that the, these there's, there's before, another right? there's a, like just a few years yeah, exactly, ago. Well, yeah, like, there's another there's a but because people are coming and like you know public officials are worried about that like you're going to have so many people that they can't you know you, you might not be able to go anywhere. They're telling people to like you know have two weeks of food on hand or something. But uh, I suppose that makes sense. Yeah, I mean yeah. where we're so, going, we're we're allowing like a couple of days to leave. Right. And, and so getting there a, a couple of days beforehand. But so there's a fear of, there's still that fear there of like something like an eclipse. It's like, yeah. like some like deep prime, primal fear that we have. I'm not. Uh, I guess this, some people do. I've never noticed anybody <laughs> having a fear of it. This time we're not. I'm, Nashville was in the, in the path of the totality last time. Yeah. 2017. But now I think we're like, I think we're still like 90% or 80%. Yeah, it's almost here. the same track. It's, yeah. it's kind of where, oh, no, it's not. It, it was going northwest to southeast. Now it's going southwest yeah, the, to northeast. Yeah. Southern Illinois is be, Southern Illinois would be the closest to here. Yeah. Uh-huh. So right it, uh, I time. remember last time a really cool thing was the when the sunlight was coming through like a, a tree or something like that. The uh, All the shadows showed. Project them, yeah. the shadows of all the little uh crescents yeah that was so cool yeah the partial eclipse that was here earlier this year i went out and took pictures of all those shadows but yeah just seeing that did you guys see the total eclipse last time you must have yeah i did in nashville yeah yeah Yeah. i mean it was just we didn't have to go anywhere yeah time just stands still and kind of yeah you feel something for sure yeah good lead into ken because that's the last time i saw him in 2017 yeah he invited he invited my wife and i uh, out to St. Louis and he found out there was a paddle wheel steamer chartered to watch the eclipse. So we got on a paddle wheel steamer on the Mississippi river and um, the guy, as we were getting close to the eclipse time, he said, Oh, it looks like it's clouding up South of us. We're just going to stop here. So he just pointed the the boat into the, into the uh, current and just basically kept, kept us in the middle of the Mississippi and, and stationary. As the That's eclipse cool. came over. Yeah. So we were drinking mint juleps and watching the eclipse. Um, <laughs> and it was pretty amazing. I mean, I didn't take a picture of it. I didn't want to take a picture of it. You can see plenty. And then any, any one I would have taken would have sucked. Um, what I wanted to see was just the, I just wanted to see the eclipse and experience it without any break in it. So I just, you know, put my little, actually when it goes behind, you know, when it's in totality, you can take the glasses off, but it's just like. The pictures of it do not do it justice, as you know. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. It's so, pretty, pretty yeah, nice. it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. It really was yeah. awesome to see that. I think I was in second grade the first, whenever the last time there was like a full eclipse where I was. So. Oh, I've only seen that one. None came through California the entire time. At least I know of that. I, 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 I've been alive and I've lived in Southern California all my life. So. There are a bunch of partials, but never a total eclipse. And I saw an annular eclipse in Albuquerque about, oh, 10 or 15 years ago <laughs> with Travis Walton, actually. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> yeah. His, my friend, it was a, her best, his, her, his girlfriend's best friend at the time. So we just all got in a car and went out to this like ranch area and just watched the sun get 90% covered. And I still have a picture somewhere of him. And then afterwards we went and went and had green chili and, 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 uh, tortillas. And he, um, talked to me about the, about people being assholes about him doing about his claims. And also, um, some of the music he liked and stuff it was a really nice, uh, time to just sit and talk to him, which yeah. was nice. Yeah. He's a, he's an interesting guy. You know, we had him on uh, a few years ago mm-hmm. and I actually, you know, we talked about, you know, of course what happened, but I actually got yeah. him to talk um, about, I was like, Travis, have you ever had any other paranormal related experience? It's not like a UFO thing. And he had like, basically he had had like a, this experience where uh, he fell asleep and like the gas, I think the gas was on in the house and he, that someone had left it on. Mm-hmm. And he managed to like out of, he had an out of body experience where he saw that and then woke himself up and was able to turn it off before anything bad could happen. 
It was something oh, okay. like that. I have. I was going to say I didn't hear. It's like I was thinking. Oh, you know what? I do know that story because I remember right. thinking. Well, maybe he just smelled gas in his in his you know in his uh, negotiate state. That's what it told him. But who knows? Yeah, it was um, something like. You probably would have said, was, "I didn't smell any gas. I just woke up." It was an interesting. Uh, it, it was interesting. I mean, because you know, you find that with, of course, you find that with a lot of people that have those experiences that they've had other, t- quote unquote, other types of experiences. Yeah, I don't think I knew to ask him that question when I was with him, but somehow I guess I'd heard that story from him at some point. Yeah. Um. But yeah, and Ken Thomas. Uh, he was on the boat. He found out um, through his job. It was a bunch of people at his job at, at the University of uh, Missouri, St. Louis, where he worked in the archive for like 30 something years. Yeah. Um, and I met him in a, in 99 or 2000, I think, <laughs> at a UFO convention in Laughlin, uh, the UFO Congress, uh, where he was speaking. Uh, and Nick Redfern wanted to interview him. So, Nick and I went up to his room and interviewed Ken, or Nick did, and I just talked to him. Um, oh, but I had met him a couple of years before, I think, at uh, at one of the UFO conventions out here in L.A., and we talked a little bit, but we hadn't really kept in touch. But um, after Nick and I went and talked to him at uh, Laughlin uh, UFO Congress, then we kept in touch, and he... Uh, I don't think I ever wrote anything for Steam Shovel Press. Oh, I think I did, but it was just something that he had, uh, an interview or something he had done with one in Steam Shovel Press, which was what his um, magazine journal zine was called. Uh, and yeah, he his first book was The Octopus that he wrote with uh, uh, Jim Keith, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, I read that book before I met him. And then when I, after I met him, uh, we talked about it quite a bit. He was also very heavily, of course, into the Kenny assassination and RFK and MLK and um, things like that. And the connections between them. He wrote books about, he even wrote a book about Maury Island, uh, the Maury mm-hmm. Island UFO incident. Good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah and with tons of research with uh, things that, you know, I didn't know that um, <clears throat> uh, that. Harold Dahl's son, one of the witnesses, like he ran off for a while and disappeared right after it. Nobody knew where he was. And then he came back and he couldn't remember where he was or what he was doing. Another strange thing associated with something that people, some people say is a hoax, um, including uh, the uh, one of the other witnesses. Not the, um, I can't remember if uh, Crisman was a witness or he was just, no, he was, he was a guy, he was uh, Harold Dahl's like boss or boss, something at the yeah, time. He, yeah. He owned the ship. Or the yeah. I mean, yeah, but Ken had this idea that he was involved with the Kennedy assassination and thought he was one of the three tramps, which I doubted. But um, you know, the, it, it's uh, some people think it's E. Howard Hunter or something that 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 one uh, figure. But anyway, um, Ken and I, uh, I went to his funeral actually a few months ago. Uh, I traveled out to St. Louis and went to his funeral. Um, he's he's buried. Um, a stone's throw from William S. William S. Burroughs' grave. A long stone's throw. I mean, you have to throw it pretty good. Right. Um, but you can walk there in like less than five minutes. I did it. I walked after Ken's, the, the ceremony at his uh, grave site. I, everybody left and I walked over to Burroughs' grave site. The last time I was there was when Ken showed it to me mm-hmm. before the eclipse. Uh, but the main thing I can say about Ken is... Uh, he went places, not you know physically, but he went places in his research that nobody had before. Um, showed a lot of people the way, not a lot of people followed. Um, he was sufficiently skeptical about things. He thought I was way too skeptical, but that's okay. We had good natures discussions about it all the time. He'd always say, "Greg, you read too much of that skeptical literature." I was like. And I'm just asking you questions. I'm not. I'm not saying you're full of shit or anything. So he uh, uh, basically. I mean, I think for that period, for like the '90s through the 2000s, um, he was probably one of the best known and respected um, people in the conspiracy world. And you, you guys probably know. did. You guys ever have him on your show? Oh yeah, we had him once twice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I think because of you, um, I, you had suggested us to him, and he reached out to me. No, oh. and I, I was vaguely familiar with him, um, and then I think I said something to Serfiel, and he was like, "Oh, that's one of the big conspiracy guys of all time, the Steve yeah. Steve Shovel Press," and mm-hmm. um, we had him on about the Trump book that he did. Oh uh, yeah, Trumpocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we had him on about the octopus, the octopus book, because that was a one that I'd always wanted to talk about on the show. And he was the perfect. Yeah, yeah I, I loved speaking with Ken. He was always like really awesome, pleasant to talk to. And yeah, he had like so many stories of all these like conferences and conventions that, you know, there was one funny story that you told me. I don't know. You may or may not want to repeat it, but he, <laughs> uh, um, I will. He'd want about, us to. <laughs> something about your radio station. Oh, him turning me into the FCC? Yes, yes. That was a funny story. <laughs> I, I was on an a internet radio station called Kill Radio for a while. And uh, actually, I was on a, actually a pirate station, a full-fledged FM right. pirate station from 98 to about 2000 until the FCC busted it twice. And the second time, they confiscated the equipment. Um, <laughs> what was the range of it, uh, Greg? Or wattage? Yeah, what was the? It how- was forty watts. There is a the woman that ran it, Sue. Um, she she wrote a book called Forty Watts from Nowhere about that's about our time there, and I'm I'm listed in there as um as a, I think Space Brother. Um, I did a show on that that station for a couple of years until the FCC busted them. And then I went to Kill Radio, um, an internet station that was 24-hour internet. Um, and that was, you know, 2001 or something when, when nobody had internet stations. I was on right. there for about seven, eight years. And then the, the, the station just, uh, it went down for a while, for a couple of months. And I'd been very slowly putting together my bug out plan of being able to do this from my house. So I finally did it. Um, but Kill Radio at some point, some of the people in Kill Radio wanted to broadcast the internet signal as a pirate station in LA. So we used the same frequency because it was open at the time, 104.7. That's that's the the K, KBLT was the name of the pirate station. You re- returned to the scene of a crime is what that is. <laughs> Yeah, well, there was another station called Pirate Cat Radio that had a really low wattage from from Hollywood, and used to we used to be able to hear that too, and we'd step on each other because you know L.A. has completely crap. One hundred four seven is now a, a station that you can't get anymore because somebody bought the license um, for the frequency, but they wanted to put Kill Radio on on Pirate, and I said you can put it on the roof of my building. And I'm just like a two-story building. Oh, the, the KBLT signal, you could hear it 30 miles away in Long Beach. Cool. Because it was up on a hill in Silver Lake. So it's line of sight. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. That's pretty that's a pretty good range. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great range for a pirate yeah. station. Yeah. Um absolutely. Uh and when it was on so I said, let's just put it on my roof. So we got some ladders and they they bought the equipment from somebody that built it, I think in Arizona. And the antenna has to be the length that the frequency is to send out that frequency. It's like, you know, 104.7, you know, 1.47 meters or something like that. And so we put that, we put guy wires up on the roof, which for a while made the roof leak. Um, and I had the transmitter sitting basically about, two feet away from where I'm sitting right now. The wire's going out the window and up to the roof, to the antenna. And we just ran it 24-7, and I just rebroadcast the the uh, signal. Then every once in a while, I'd cut in and do my... <laughs> with permission, I'd cut in and do my own show. So I was doing pirate radio out of my my living... My, well, actually, my bedroom, my, my desk for a while. And then um, I had was working a night shift... And so we didn't want to get caught. Um, oh, the, the Kill Radio one, we didn't want to get caught. So that only broadcast Friday nights from like 5 or 6 o'clock to Monday mornings to like 5 or 6 o'clock. Because we figured the FCC wasn't in their offices then. They were out for the weekend. Mm. Um, and it was fine for about three or four months. I went to work because I was on a night shift. And um, 
when I got back and in the morning, Ken said, oh, the FCC came and left this letter. I was like, what? Or no, the FCC came and asked if this is where the station was. And I told and I told him, he said, I don't know, but he gave his, my name and all that. It's like, Ken, you're a conspiracy researcher. You gave me up to the man. <laughs> yeah. He said, what am I supposed to do? You live here. So I gave him a slight <laughs> amount of crap for it, but um, yeah, I still have the I still have the letter from the FCC, the cease and desist letter. I'm so proud of that thing. So, so, so you just, so, just stopped after that. It was that was well. It. They said you must prove by you know it was like a month and a half later by this date that you have a license and blah. It's like of course we didn't have a license. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not like insurance; you could just go run and get it. Yeah. yeah. The complaint came from Gardena, which is where the FCC office is located. So I think there was some inside thing going on there. So I don't think anybody complained. It's just the FCC it was just like, we don't like this. Um, but Does yeah, that I got stuff a, still exist. Those pirate radio stations like that. I think so, but it's really diminished because of the internet. Uh, yeah. Because you can, yeah. you know, you can get to far more people just by doing a podcast like you guys are doing. Right. Um, but. They said, yeah, you have to prove to us by a certain date. And it was like a week and a half, two weeks later that you have a license. And we thought, well, screw it. They caught us anyway. So we just went on 24-7 until the actual last possible day. And the last 20 or 30 minutes of our broadcast ever, I went on and did a live show and just talked about why we did it and what we were doing and and told everybody, thank you for listening. And I was probably talking to 100 people at that point or maybe a couple hundred, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think I recorded it actually the very last broadcast for, uh, for, uh, the K KB, I mean, sorry, the K kill radios, uh, FM station. I think I also did it at KBLT too. I, I did a goodbye on that one too, cause we were being shut down. So was that radio, were you just, was it radio Mysterioso then that you were playing on that or was it, it's called something else? Um, my first show was, um, hungry ghost because I was on in the middle of the night and has a Buddhist connotation. Gotcha. The first interview I did, I think was with Scott Corrales. Um, I did interviews. I did interviews in 98, 99 when I was on that pirate station. Usually I just played music, but every once in a while I just have people yeah. and interview them if they were up because on the East coast, it's like five or six in the morning and on one, I was doing my show. So if I could get somebody right. up early enough, I'd do an interview with them. So I did a few, um, that's where I first started doing interviews was on a pirate station, an FM pirate station in LA. Do you have any of that stuff recorded? Yeah. I made cassettes of it. Cause that's the only nice. way we can do it. Yeah. Um, cool. So I still have probably 30 or 40 cassettes of my old KBLT show. And then I've got um, CDs of my uh, shows and interviews on, on kill radio, which was a lot longer. That was like seven or eight years. So I still have those. I've, I found one with Ann Druffle that I don't think has ever been ever. It, it was live at the time, but I don't think it's ever been broadcast. So I'm, I've been editing it down and be just interesting. It's just interesting to hear Ann Druffle talking in the probably 2004 or five or something like that when she was still alive, obviously. UFO researcher from Southern California. I met her at a MUFON meeting. I said, can we do an interview? And she said, okay. So we did one on my show and I found the CDs few months ago and I've been, um, I digitized it now. There's noises and junk in it. So I'm trying to clean it out, but yeah. there's a few lost interviews. Um, to, to get back to Ken, um, uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't know this. He was best man at my wedding. I mean, we were good enough friends that I just asked him to be best man. And uh, David Childress used some, some uh, uh, miles he had to flew Ken out here as a gift. I guess that was David's gift for my, my wedding gift was to fly Ken out. So he'd be able to be our um, best man. Uh, I didn't talk to Ken much in the last maybe six months of his life. I think he was dealing with some health problems. Yeah. Uh, when I was there, I had to take him to dialysis a couple of times. I had to drive him to dialysis. Um, but uh yeah, one time it, this diabetes got so bad they, they had to amputate part of his foot. Yeah, uh, I don't know about eight or, eight or nine months before he passed away. I I talked to him when he was in the hospital. He didn't. He was not happy. One time he called. He said, "This is it, Greg. I'm. I don't. I'm. 
I think I'm going to die here. I'm not going to talk to you ever again. You've been such a good friend. And I, th- I, I, I think this is it. And I said, Ken, stop it. You're just, you're just pissed off and scared because you're in the hospital. And he called me the next day and he said, I don't know what was going on. It must have been <laughs> drugs they put me on or something, but I was paranoid. But he was fine after that. I sent him, I sent him care packages at the hospital. And when I sent him food, they opened it up and stole all the food. Somebody that did. Sucks. Yeah, I sent him books and and magazines and candy and you know stuff like that. But yeah, the the, the second time when I sent him actually because the hospital food was terrible, so I was trying to smuggle him in good food. <laughs> right. But it it got uh, opened and and cleaned out, and then he got some books with uh, with food stains on them. Was your zine um, around at the same time as the height of street, steam shovel press? Um, just yeah. Kind of want some insight into what the interaction of more the ufo world um and the conspiracy world at that at that time was like yeah sorry i realize i've been wandering but uh ken when i was when he was doing steam shovel press he had started it i think in the early 90s um and uh excluded middle started in 90 late 91 early 92 So we were concurrently publishing. Um, He actually gave me uh, pointers about like printers and how he did layouts and all that stuff. We discussed that quite a bit um, afterwards. Uh, But yeah, they they were concurrent. Uh, We were sort of mining the same stuff. He would have UFO stuff in his magazine and I would have conspiracy stuff in mine. I mean, we, 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 there was a lot of crossover. It wasn't just a UFO magazine and Ken's wasn't just a conspiracy magazine. It was basically any weirdness, you know. Um, did I think Ken had an interview that he had done with Leary, with with Timothy Leary, somewhere in there. Ken also lent me. Here's a crossover. He did an interview with John Keel sometime in the '90s on a uh, when he was on college radio, and he lent me that or gave me that recording, uh, and I had it up on um, Radio Mysterio, so it might still be there. One of the few recordings of, uh, I mean, I'm, sh- I'm sure there's others, but one of the few recordings of Keel doing an interview. And in fact, the beginning of my show where Keel says, I don't think, you know, the beginning of Radio Mysterioso, uh, yeah. the, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is not, a, is not a good explanation for this. That's from Ken's interview with John Keel. Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wondered where, where that actually came from. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's Ken's interview with John Keel, which I, I mean, it, it, if you go to Radio Mysterioso, I think if you go way down the list, or search for it. It's it's probably still there. If not, I'll I'll, I'll uh, re re uh, re upload it. But it's okay. that's a rare interview, and um, it was a good one too because Ken Ken was <laughs> Ken was a really good radio person. I I think way better than I ever was. Uh, he had a good voice for it. He had a good um, attitude. He had a really good way of asking questions. So um, that's probably another reason why he was a, a really good researcher, uh, being able to talk to people and get. Uh, get information out of them that normally you wouldn't. Um, and, you know, some of, uh, like some of his friends, like, um, oh, who was the guy? Not Sherman Skolnick. I think he he knew him. Um, oh, who's uh, the guy in Washington, D.C.? I can't remember his name. Anyway, you probably know who he is. Uh, he, he uh, I mean, we talked about, I remember when, uh, when I had Ken on, he talked about meeting people like Fletcher Prouty. Yeah, and knew um, Dick Gregory was somebody. That yeah, he, yeah, he was he was uh, friends uh, with Gregory, I think. Yeah, en- enough that he could talk to him. When, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and he'd done some interviews with him, and also, well, Gregory was into the Kennedy assassination. I think that's oh, why yeah. he and right. Ken were. And I think right. Ken probably met him at one of the uh, the um, JFK assassination conventions in Dallas that they would have every yeah. year. Well, whenever they first showed the Zapruder film on the Geraldo show. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dick Gregory was there. Oh, okay. It's one of the three. I think uh, one of the one of the researchers who assassination researchers who worked on the Zapruder film stuff. Okay, I'm so far removed from cons- conspiracy stuff right now that I, it's it's, it's, <laughs> well, it's I was hard for me to remember these things. Mainly because yeah. the conspiracy thing has gotten a bad name in the last few years. Obviously, I, yeah. Ken, and that's Ken that lamented it too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, especially um, when he was talking about uh, when he was promoting that Trumpocalypse book, and he really yeah, painted yeah. the picture for us of um, the really diverse and uh, politically crossed over world of 
80s and, and 90s conspiracy theory when that was really at a head and that also crossed over into UFOs and all this other stuff. But yeah, real, yeah, real it's interesting this, guy. Yeah, this apotheosis of conspiracy culture was something that, I mean, Ken lamented it. Um, Rob Sterling, who you've probably had on your show, it um, really bothered him too. It's just kind of like you've taken... You've taken all this research and this critical thought into something that's very important and just turned it into turn it into um, a political bandwagon or at least a a a, um, a platform for for blind belief. And they they absolutely were against that kind of thing. Ken, I know, was um, he would change his opinion if he got new information. He was not wedded to any theory, like we were saying about David. This is why he was in. But Ken was a real good friend of mine. Um, that. Well- Critical thought with conspiracies has gone out the window. Oh, it absolutely has. You know, and it, it, it's 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 one place where it's needed. <laughs> wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't Smiles Lewis? Wasn't he interviewed for some article about? Yes, he was. That? Yeah, yeah. I, I just spent a week with him in uh, in the Eastern Sierra, just hanging out with him and my friend Robert, who was one of the fa- co-founders of Excluded Middle. So I got to talk to. Um, miles quite a bit and he told me about that interview and what had happened and he said that he was at first he was uh it was a researcher that was doing research on conspiracy culture for i think a university or for a doctorate or something like that and she had connections at the new york times and they asked you to do an article on it uh and miles just kind of floated to the top as the person she wanted to profile because he had <laughs> Just like we were talking about here, we had he had gone through this. What what has happened to my beautiful conspiracy culture? Well, uh, I feel this. I feel the same way, Greg. So yeah, so uh, yeah, My, Miles became kind of the touchstone of that because she was talking. It basically she asked. I was in the article too for a little bit. I talked to her for like two hours. Um, but the you know the main point of that was you know what we've just been saying. It's like we used to or they used to, I wasn't really a conspiracy researcher so much. Um, look for, you know, absolute sources, um, make educated guesses and, and, uh, and try and follow the, the, uh, the trail and the, the evidence where it led uh, and not have your theory lead, lead the evidence. Um, but I think that's, uh, as you've, you've said, both of you, I think, is that that's changed completely now. It's mostly whatever my belief is, let me find the evidence to back it up, um, no matter what that might be or how dangerous that might, might be or how wrong it is. Or, And I think this is what Ken was the most upset about, is how the information is used to scare and hurt people. That That's yeah. what he really, that's what he was really worried about. And I think yeah. Miles is and Robert is and all these people that were, Conspiracy people in the nineties, eighties, nineties, whatever, early two thousands. Um, it's just it's it's a political tool now. Or before it was a questioning of authority, which is you know people think they're questioning authority now, but it's it's basically authorities are feeding them fears, and then yeah. it becomes a loop. So it's become a, a propaganda tool. Yeah, conspiracies is now propaganda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's what Ken said in his in his interview with you. I I would say though that though the methods now are usually much less scholarly <laughs> to, for sure. Yeah. Uh, for everything you know, really. So the yeah. conspiracy thing just follows it. Yeah. Everything else. But the, those kind of extremist political projects were definitely always there, but it just seems to have been, um, I think they were interested too in courting the other side. And, um, you know, so you had people like, say like the LaRouche people who, you know, you wouldn't really be able to tell that these weren't even kind of run of the mill leftists until you really start digging in. And then you're like, oh, you guys are like some weird cult or, you know, a lot of other yeah. kind of propaganda projects. But it was an environment that was a lot more diverse, this kind of conspiracy world. Yeah. Just in general. That that place where far left and far right meet is um <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> you you see it now. I mean, there's Total, total far right wing people with really strange ideas that match up with people that are in the new age movement. And it's, it, to me, it's like, that's mind boggling to me, but it, it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's always been that way. It's just that it's become more, yeah, more common now. I think it's it, hard it, for us to, uh, have kind of that, it's harder to have that 
kind of Discordian, playful distance from things like yeah. I think we might have, you know, used it to have is. been afforded. And now everything's just too, too real and too ugly. And these things that you used to, you know, have fun, kind of have fun with that seem to have less consequence now are just really, really nasty. Yeah. You can't, you can't have that distance from it because you're going to, whatever you say, you're going to be tarred with some brush right? by somebody. Uh, and, you know, at, at the time in the nineties, when I like kind of got into this, the brush was your, <laughs> your crazy conspiracy theorist, or you're a crazy UFO researcher, or you're a crazy, you know, Bigfoot uh, believer or whatever. And now that's kind of like, it's almost a, you know, it's almost normal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I said this to Miguel once I said, I wish, I wish UFOs would just go back to being no, not, nobody cares about it. It's no big deal. It's just not a subject anybody really discusses or, or, um, or bases any, you know, spends a lot of time with. And it's not because you said, Oh, you want to be a hipster. I was like, no, it has nothing to do with that. I think the more attention that's paid to it, um, the less, uh, I don't know about authentic, but the less um, variety we get out of it. You know what I mean? Because whenever anything's codified, I mean, it's like it's a band you really like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, suddenly a lot of people start listening to them. So they conform to what people want or that thing that everybody likes and they lose their originality. They just become yep. that act. And I, I I feel like the UFO thing has become an act. It's just been you know, does the, what does the government know about aliens and are they going to tell us about it? And <laughs> Everything else has been, you know, it, for most of the public, everything's been sucked into that. Yeah. Um, that for the most part. But, you know, uh, there are people. So funny. I've been seeing things on online now where people are reading Mac Tony's books. Like, oh, my God, have you seen this? It's like, yeah, the book's like 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. It's you like know? completely it, completely new to them. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, of course, you know, I can say, well, you know, you didn't know that. It's like, I've just been looking at this and my friends have been looking at this for a long time. I'm glad People are looking at those things and seeing those things and talking about, you know, um, alternatives to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. In fact, somebody on one of the lists the other day said, I'm going to say something really weird. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to say that uh, maybe there is something to the ETA (laughs) because so many people were talking away from it. So it almost became radical to go back to it in a very short time, which is actually kind of refreshing. <laughs> I like that back and forth. I like the, the the craziness, and i I don't often I don't often participate. I don't I don't engage because it's just. I mean, I'll say something, and then I'll just feel like, oh God, I shouldn't have said that because people immediately get upset. Or, I mean, it's the internet, you know. It's uh, that sea lioning thing. Do you know about that? The, the what? I did not know about this term until recently. There's a cartoon where this uh, it's these um, uh, two people are talking, and one person says, "Well, you know, I I, I like most uh, animals, but I can't really couldn't do uh, could do without sea lions." And the, her friend says, "Oh my God, you shouldn't have said that. Now you've done it." And a sea lion shows up. And he says, I couldn't help but notice you were saying something bad about sea lions. Right. And the, and yeah. the the sea lion just won't let her alone after that. It's like. Yeah. So, are, are, do, you, were, do you have do you have any data to back up this opinion, this negative opinion about sea lions? Then it shows up at breakfast. It shows up at her bedroom. She's like, "I'm trying to sleep." All right, we will continue in an hour. It's like that. That's basically well, that's what's pretty going much on. that's the pretty internet. much a, that's pretty yeah. much a internet discourse. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it, it has a name now: sea lining. <laughs> let me ask. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Greg. Kind of turn into a well. Uh, you were just talking. I promise about, I didn't about, have any coffee before the show. You just talk about how <laughs> UFOs are like it, it's 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 too famous. I wish it would kind of retreat. But I guess that being said, that since well, let's just say 2017, with all the you know to the stars academy and all that stuff started happening, and the uh, the big revelations in the new york times and all this has there been anything since then that you would say that stands out to you or is it still just kind of all just a big mess the thing is there that stands movement out movement forward in the last few yeah years? yeah you know what the movement forward is and how i kind of aligned myself was with academics i almost almost had the idea to go back and get a phd in in uh in art history which is what my only degree 
to deal with this uh, issue. Um, and the good thing about all this, I can complain, yeah, I wish nobody paid attention. You know, this is my thing and my friends. It's like, no, no, no. The good thing about this is it's made it okay for um, people with credentials to be interested, whereas before they had to hide it. Yeah. And so that's a really good upshot of it. I mean, there's also the Velikovsky thing, of, uh, not Velik Velikovsky, um, um, Velikovsky. Uh, the um, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Who was that? Uh, 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 Hune. That said that um, you know scientific uh, science changes by either by uh, you know slow slow um, uh, evolution or 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 you know or very slowly or very quickly, and the way it changes slowly is by you know a whole bunch of people finding different information. Um, the second way it changes slowly is all the people that were promoting the old information die off, which I think is what's going on now. And the third way is some incredible discovery that nobody can deny. Um, that scientists uh, have to change all of their thinking and all their theories, or at least modify them to accommodate the new information. Um, and I think for UFOs, it's just the fact that uh, whenever you think of Elizondo and the New York Times article and, you know, uh, uh, to the stars, like you mentioned, all that, it has made it okay for credentialed people who, who, who are... Um, very circumspect about what they do to discuss this. And so I think, you know, some of the most interesting things have come out of, you know, from, from academics like Kripal, who was doing this beforehand. Um, uh, right, Diana, yeah, of course. Say, Kripal's been doing it for a while, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's, yeah, he, he's an exception. Or, or no. you know, Diana Pasolka or or, or Stephen Finley or people like that. Mm -hmm. um, or, or Mike Masters. That It's been okay for them to talk about this. And of course, you know, they're all under 40, or I think near it, or far over that, we're close enough to it that that's a different generation. The ones that were like, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to, you know, the 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 AARO report, the one from the official report that came out. To me, that's like an old guard report, um, and people are really unhappy with it because it says, you know, the same thing the government's been saying for a long time. In essence, that we don't have any information, we don't have any information or data or proof that this is anything um, extraterrestrial. It could be, but we don't have enough proof now um, that, you know, and I kind of agree with that, but the, in the, in the details, the details are very, you know, almost like that old, I'm, I'm afraid to even look at this because it's going to have, it, it'd be too much of a pain in the butt to change everything. Um, but the, like I said, the, the, the upshot is that I think that, new ideas have come and will come from academia and not, not from UFO researchers. And I, I think about 10 years ago, I said, I wish, I wish people with degrees would look at this because then nobody will pay any attention to you about ufologists anymore. Um, and I think that's still happening. I, th I think we're in the middle of that, or at least they'll have to share the stage with, with people with degrees and from colleges and universities and all that which is fine. They're not really sharing the stage. I mean, they're having separate, I've been to both conferences. I've been, and to me, the academic conferences are far more interesting than the, than the regular ufology conferences. Yeah. Just, so I hear new things there that I have not heard before. You went to the rise conference, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. first one and the second one. Yeah. What was your thoughts on it? I mean, it, was it, um, the archives, and I wish I could see some of these presentations, yeah. but you can like, yeah, they're on yeah. YouTube. Oh, they are? Okay. They're all online, yeah. I even got I to talk for 10 still... minutes. Yeah, I heard about that. But the first one. I mean, it was I was on a panel with people, and they said, if there's anything you want to talk about, please bring it up. It's like, yes, there is something I want to talk about. So I talked about the ufology tarot. Um, the, I thought that those conferences were basically the opening shot of academia is interested in this is, and is going to pursue it. And yes, it's the archives of the impossible, and they're talking about uh, keeping all these um, uh, records and, and uh, papers and uh, uh, letters, things like that, from from different UFO researchers. I mean, it would started with Valet saying he was going to donate his uh, archives to the uh, his um, papers to the archive when he's gone. Um, but also quickly followed by Whitley Strieber and uh, and. Um, uh, some of the uh, remote viewing people, they all started putting stuff in there. And I think that 
the fact that they take it seriously enough to be able to want to say that these these artifacts and these these documents are important is the uh, is the is the significance behind this, and then everything else follows from that. I mean, uh, uh, all the presentations there I thought were were I mean any one of them would to me would be outstanding at a regular UFO conference, and they're all at that one conference, and the same with the second one. Uh, just all, all, it's one of, the, you know, you go to a UFO conference, you go, okay, I can see that. Okay. I can miss that. I couldn't miss anything. I sat through the entire both days, um, both times. Saul conference too, recently. It was all, whether I agreed or understood or not, it was vitally interesting to me to see all these, um, scientists and some government people talking about the subject, uh, in a different way that's been talked, than been, has been discussed before. One of the best things I heard at the Saul conference, it was from Valet, and people have probably seen this. Um, there was a guy up there talking about the Schumer Amendment, the one that basically got defeated um, about UFO openness uh, by the government. Right. And he said, uh, this was before it was defeated. And the guy was saying, well, we're going to have you know all these uh, records, and we're going to keep very good records, and we're going to take uh, information from military people. And, and Valet stood up and he said, are you taking any information from UFO witnesses and abductions and, and things like that? Because if you're not, you're missing probably way more than half or a great deal, three quarters of the data you could be gathering. Because they had, they hadn't said, well, just regular people that have uh, experiences were not, weren't, they didn't say anything about including that. And he says, well, you have to include that because then you're only getting part of the, the picture. And, I thought was a you know I thought that was the greatest point made during the whole <laughs> the uh, the whole two days of that conference. Um, you can't you can't trust the government to have most people's interest in mind. It's it's such a weird thing because supposedly the government's for the people, but uh, especially with some controversy like this, that's so hooked in with intelligence and defense. It's just you they're so married you can't pull them apart. So if you're looking to the government for all your 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 answers, you're basically getting you're, you're getting uh, only part of the story, and so the, the whole story has to come from from uh, from private research and from witnesses themselves. That data has to be entered. And then he finally said, he said, "What I'm going to concentrate on now is all the weirdest stuff and the stuff that people don't want to concentrate on, that people don't want to talk about." I think that's where the answer lies. There's that statement again. Does so conversely, does anything worry you about the em embracing of the subject by academia or, you know, I mean, obviously there's those problems with uh, em it being embraced by government, Yeah, uh, but maybe some kind of perspectives being lost or just almost like we're, what we were talking about earlier with this uh, octopus documentary that for some reason we don't really know why does not, you know, mention uh, Ken Thomas at all, even though they show his book and go to his archive that they just refer to as yeah. an archive uh, there in St. Louis. But, um, you know, is yeah, there something that the, you think might get lost in, in translation from academia embracing this and something they can maybe do to uh, keep some kind of connection to the previous non-academic research? I think the humanities and the arts and 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 even something like a non non hard science i suppose like sociology i don't think they're going to have any problem um uh, because even though once in a while i'll see a paper or something it's like my god this was discussed extensively in the 70s what are you doing once they start doing more of a literature review they'll get a little bit of better 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 idea of the history what has gone on before what people have found out before um and there's a huge treasure trove of stuff there. It's just not presented as, you know, a paper with an abstract that was published in a, in a, in a uh, scientific journal. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of these people I've talked to realize that. They realize that the a lot of this information, good information, important information, is going to come from um, private researchers that... <laughs> With all the all the uh, problems and issues and and agendas that come along with that, but you have to really do a literature review and really find out what has gone on before before you start going forward. And then basically 
um, repeating somebody else's uh, hard work that occurred, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years before you. Um, I think that's the, the greatest um, uh, challenge. The other one is, and Diana points this out in her book, in her first book in uh, American Cosmic, uh, researchers, academic researchers are used to people being uh, to the free flow of information, mm -hmm. supposedly. Um, they share their sources. They share, you know, it's like, where did you get this idea? Well, I got it from this one. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's citations in the work. Um, but um, I think that they, because of that background, some of them may trust UFO researchers and, and uh, people with an agenda a little bit too much uh, because they think they're being straight with them. And sometimes they're not. I mean, they're not. They're not talking to academics. They're talking to regular people. Some are. Some are smart. Some are dumb. Some are charlatans. Some aren't. And sometimes I see that that filter not working too well with academics because their 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 sphere is free flow of information. And outside of that sphere, it's not really, um, mm -hmm. especially the UFO stuff or anything that gets people excited or has a history like ufology does. So yeah, that discernment I think will come, and I, and I see it developing in in the people that I talk to, which is good. I've actually helped them with it. It's like this person's good. It's like oh, that person's actually kind of wacko, and uh, it's good as a sociology experiment, but for real information, no, probably not a good idea. Just yeah. stuff like that. I mean, it, and it's, like I said, it's just it's 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 developing, and I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, that would be my biggest fear is like kind of. Uh, um, either being too trusting or conversely ivory towering it and not really paying attention. Like you said at the beginning, not really going to doing the literature review of stuff that's come before. Um, but that's going to be in anything. It's going to be in, in any, any intellectual pursuits going to have those problems. So, but the, the upshot is it's great that they're looking at this stuff. I mean, the, the conversations I had at, 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 at it's fantastic at, at those play at great. those conferences were they were so information rich and so interesting to me yeah. um, as opposed to going and having somebody tell me, you know, wh which star system they, they think so-and-so is <laughs> coming from. It's like, well, okay, you know, I've heard that about 8,000 times. I'd like to hear it, something new for me. It's good right. that it's good that as academics and especially as religious studies academics, yeah. that they are taking it seriously because one of the things that I've, thought about this since I've been studying it is that it's just another form of uh, religious experience. And so that their fact that they're beginning to take something like that seriously. I mean, if you look at something like uh, Betty Andreessen and her experience, experience, you know, I mean, it's very religious, has a lot of religious overtones, but that's just one example. And I think what you're seeing is just another form of, of maybe a kind of particularly American form of, of religious experience, but it, it is yeah, of belief experience yeah. nonetheless. Well, the whole UFO thing up to this point has uh, been mostly belief, <laughs> right? A lot of the information is, has flowed from belief. And then any information we get from that is, you know, which is why, you know, APRO and, and QFOs and all, and move on to some extent, all they, they want to collect data without that in, in content in it. Um, but move on. Move on conversely, it should be in there. Hmm? Move on is fine with uh, uh, super soldiers from Mars talking about blue avians, though they are fine about that. Yeah, a couple of years ago at their conference, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Mufon right now. Like, like I said, I have friends in there, and the rank and file. I gave a lecture at Mufon like well, I don't know seven or eight years ago, Orange County Mufon, and I got a letter from the organizer later saying. Um, we were insulted by your talk saying that people were making things up. And I was like, I didn't say anything at the time of the kind. I said that we have to, to realize what people's perceptions are and to, and to factor that into the equation. Yeah. I didn't say people weren't seeing things or that UFOs were, right. were, were, were not. I was like, what? But Talk I went out. Religion. I, yeah. I went out to dinner with the people that were there talking, seeing the lecture. They got it. They totally got it. Right. <laughs> Well, so I don't. I, I used to say get rid of Mufon, and I, you know, maybe get rid of the Mufon. Uh, um, maybe some of the people that run it. I don't know, but 
I think it still provides a service for people that have nowhere else to go yeah. that are either interested in this or they've had an experience. They need some sort of um, validation that somebody else has had this experience in, in a group and kind of a safe group where they can talk about this. And that that and it's apart from all the politics and what's his name getting getting arrested and John Ventry being a racist and all that. Um, for these people, it's still useful. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate in a lot of ways, but it's all they have. And so I've kind of backed off and being so nasty about MUFON. Um, it needs to be there. People need that that nexus of, of uh, uh, you know, so, social structure to be able to um, discuss this in a way that that uh, helps them out. You know, if some, at some for some people, it's the only way they have to kind of process what's happened to them. And that's, you know, if for nothing else, that's that's what it should exist for apart from all the other stuff and gathering the data and all that stuff and doing TV shows or whatever the hell else they do. Um, and there's good people there. I have, I have friends in there that, um, that that are totally down with what we've been talking about here, and they don't care about the ETH, or they think it's just sure. one of many ideas. And that's not the official MUFON party line. What do you think about Dave Grush? <laughs> Was that in your list of questions? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people have been comparing him to Paul Benowitz, and I don't think that's a fair comparison. I think if you wanted to make a comparison, it'd probably be more like a um, no, I was trying to, a Bob Lazar mm. to me. Uh, he's kind of a very developed Bob Lazar, where uh, Lazar, I think, was saw things and was shown things and was allowed to say things. Otherwise, we would not have heard about him. <laughs> people keep saying, oh, you got all this information out. It's like, no, he was supposed to for I don't know what reason. But it was a military, industrial, defense, hardware, et cetera, et cetera, reason. Not aliens are here and we're we're developing, you know, whatever. They're, we're, they're, we're back engineering their, their technology. And to me, I think Grush is kind of the same thing. Somebody somewhere about around 2017 or a few years before that, I would factor Bigelow and his people into this equation too. Um, somebody somewhere in the government uh, or some group of people wanted to use the UFO subject for something for, for as a fulcrum for, for doing something else. And so they just said, well, let's, let's just tickle this a little bit and see what happens. And, and it, I'm, I'm pretty sure it has to do with, with technology and intelligence and counterintelligence and new, new technology being developed and, um, ways to find out who else has that technology and how they're using it or how they're using it against us. Who knows? I pointed this out on, on Tim Benal's show a few weeks ago. Um, I have a, a friend that works in Los Alamos. And she said, do you want a job? I said, well, what are you talking about? She goes, Los Alamos is hiring like mad. I said, why? She said, because it's a nuclear arms race on with China right now, and they're building nuclear bombs like nobody's business. I said, I remember what? Listening. Yeah. Yeah, that's not scary at all, is it? Yeah. And I said, hmm, very strange that all this UFO stuff comes up right around this. I mean, it, I mean, that's my conspiracy mind thinking. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, um, long time ago, Bill Moore told me this. He said, I was complaining about UFO people, and he said, they always think it's about them. Meaning, if some information about UFOs comes from the government, they think, well, they are, they're finally going to tell us about UFOs. This is, uh, this is what we've been waiting for. And almost assuredly, it has nothing to do with UFO researchers or revealing anything. It has to do with some kind of, some kind of um, project or, 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 or um, uh, so, some kind of intelligence thing that's being run or some way of pulling information or seeing what people know, or, I mean, I'm sorry, my, my uh, everything looks like a nail to me because of, uh, of project beta, but it just seems to me like these are all the same uh, earmarks. Uh, so I think Grush is sincere, just like I think Bob Lazar was sincere. Um, but I also think that <laughs> I'll tell you what happened when I saw the, the, when he did the, the testimony, I was watching and I said, oh, my God, this is a UFO convention in Congress. That's basically what it was. It's like it's like Bill Cooper getting up and saying, somebody told me that the government has these things. And I, you know, and they showed me the documents and this and that. It's like, 
okay, that's real exciting, Bill, but we're not going to be able to see it. And whoever showed it to you is just, who knows if it's real or not? I don't know. Did they show you a UFO? I mean, Grush said he talked to people who saw this. He didn't say he saw it himself. Right. Yeah. That as far was, as I know. That Yes, that's exactly what he says. And he's still. So it's a UFO his, convention for, for, yeah. for Congress. Yeah. <laughs> I've definitely talked to people who say they saw shit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But, that was the thing. It's just like whenever whenever he came out and people were like raving about him and they said that they had found, you know, this insider that had all this insider information. And then I see the footage where he says, well, I talked to people that uh, have seen them. Well, no, like you don't have any real firsthand information and you could be just being fed disinformation. And he he very much is like. He just seems like a spook to me, just the way he acts and just how he is. And just, I guess, I mean, yeah. he's got, yeah, he's apparently he has like real low level of autism or something like that. Does. You can't fault um, him for that, but he just very, he's very cagey and just, you know, I don't think yeah. those guys really, if, if they leave those agencies, they don't leave that mentality is what I'm saying. Yeah. That. And I think, you know, if you give him complete benefit of the doubt, he's saying things that he saw because somebody said it's okay to talk about it. That's all. But they only said it was okay to talk about it because it's useful to someone or some group of people or whatever. And if that's the case, I, I still have this um, prediction that I had at the beginning, uh, almost o- almost at, right after um, New York Times article, when whatever is th- this is for is finished, Government won't be talking about UFOs anymore. UFO yeah. researchers will be like, hey, how come they didn't say that? it's a cover up again? Well, what's going yeah. on? They're not talking about it anymore. It's like, well, because they don't need to. Whatever they were using it for is finished. It either worked or it didn't. <laughs> or it kind of worked. The shit or really goes down with China or Russia. We better hope those little fucking tic tacs do their job. Right. Yeah. Well, who knows? Uh, who knows what's going on? You know, that's the, the, the whatever these things are, I think they're probably kind of like a, and everybody, it's not an original idea, but. If any of this stuff is quote unquote real in some way, um, you know, it's one of those things where <laughs> we're not going to talk about it until it's actually used. And it, when it is used, you won't even know what it is because it'll be so far outside of your understanding. You just it, you, either it won't register or you'll think it's a solar eclipse or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's the um, solar eclipse conspiracy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, the reaction to it, just like somebody like talk about shock and awe, just something going on where you just cannot process it. And right at that point, all your stuff's being bombed, that kind of thing. So who knows? Who knows what's there? What's behind this? Whatever. I mean, you know, it may just be trying to see what people think about it now. I don't know. But it's not one thing. It's a bunch of things happening at once. Sure. And absolutely. Yeah, whenever whenever the intelligence community decides to move in a direction, they're not doing one thing. They're doing like thirty things or whatever, and I, I think they're really good at it. And they've they've had what fifty, sixty years of information about UFO um, uh, uh, researchers, rumors, how it goes through, how it goes through the room, you know, how how people talk to each other, who knows each other. It's another thing, I see people online just saying, "What do you think of this?" and it's some hot button topic. I never answer that because I, I don't want people to, I mean, they know anyway, but why make it easy? I don't want people to know who I know, what I know, what I, what makes me excited, what, what I'm pissed off about, whatever, because um, the best way to get somebody to believe whatever it is they're trying to shove at you is, is to appeal to your emotions and either <laughs> scare you or make you love something or, you know, scare you with something that, uh, that will make you react the way they want you to react or show you something that you're very strongly for so that you're for it and associate whatever it is they want you to be for with it. So um, I, I I think, you know, in light of that, I think people should keep their own counsel really, especially online about stuff. I've, I've, I've really stopped saying a lot online. I still mm-hmm. say something once in a while to my, I probably shouldn't, but Every once in a while, I'll just say, well, you know, this happened like 30 years ago in the exact same way. And then either people are interested or they get mad at me. So um, or they don't understand and I have to explain it. And it, it's just kind of like it's just because I've been in it for so long. I've got very specific, weird ideas, just like anybody that's been into this for a while. <laughs> Conspiracies, too, obviously. Isn't that yeah. one of your 
your famous uh, things that do not engage. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I had too many, too many places where I stuck my neck out by showing my, 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 either something I'm interested in or my ignorance or whatever. And then just having somebody come and chop my head off right away. It's like, well, you know what? <laughs> the internet is not made for reason debate. It's made for, it's basically a cage match and everybody knows everybody is watching and you don't want to lose. Like, oh, well, everybody saw me get beaten by this person. It's like, that's not an exchange of information or free what's, ideas. That's basically a, a, basically a public fight. What's the word, Sir Field? Net bangers? Is that a good yeah. word for that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Greg, you, you, the time we've got left, um, you are going to be actually doing our first online event here coming up. And we should say that that is going to be com coming up on April 24th. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about what you're going to be, uh, you're going to be talking about at, at that. Um, at the beginning, you said, what am I going to talk about? And I said, Oh, probably more about the UFOs and the creative thing and the art and all that. And then I thought, Wait a minute. I've been assigned for a long-term project to um, research UFO, I'm sorry, um, alien writing, uh, something I've been interested in for a long time, uh, uh, beginning with my meeting Mario Pozzaglini, Dr. Mario Pozzaglini in 1997 or so. He was a clinical psychologist, and he studied um, what he called received scripts. Uh any kind of non-human or non-human appearing language that was either seen, remembered, um, channeled uh, by some external source, trying to communicate something in something we know is writing. Uh, and the history of the UFO subject is full of those things. Um, I don't think anybody's ever proven that it's actually some alien's language my idea is it's more like if it is, you know, if there are true quote unquote uh, alien languages that they are um, probably more co-creative, like the, the person that is using it or seeing it or whatever has, has, uh, has um, uh, been inspired to do it as a reaction to their, uh, to their experience. Uh, and even though they they will say the aliens gave me this or angels told me this or whatever, it's their way of being able to figure out what happened and put some sort of sense into it. And in the middle of that is who knows, who knows what's coming through. Um, hardly any of them have been translated. And usually people that have these experiences and say they have alien writing, they say, this is not a literal language. It's trying to communicate ideas in a way that's different than language and the letters or the symbols or whatever are, are affecting the way you think about things. They're not to be read as A, B, C, D, E. They're to be read as something almost as a um, object of uh, uh, meditation. Uh, and the, the the message comes through just by looking at the shapes and and the and, and the figures. Uh, I think that's what a lot of uh, people have said about their received writing. Um, although some have said, "No, this is the aliens' writing, and this you know it's how to fly the ship or whatever." Uh, and I wanted to talk about authentic as a opposed to non-authentic, and the authentic uh, tends to be things that don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with the subjects. Uh, um, native language. Like there, there was a book written, uh, published in the 1930s from India to the planet Mars. Have you heard about that one? No. A French researcher, um, found this woman who was, uh, saying that she was getting messages from, um, I guess from some disembodied spirit, but then it turned out later, she said, no, these people are from Mars and this is the Martian language that they are showing me. Uh, and when it was analyzed, it had a one-to-one one, one relationship with, with um, French because that was her native language. And so the letters were A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But, you know, they were, they, they were, they were just written. They were just like weird symbols and things. But they, they each had like they were, you know, 27 or 26 or 28 letters or whatever. And all the, the words were formed by those things, even though they might be weird words that we wouldn't think of. Um, but... Uh, but there's others where, like I said, people just say there's you you can't translate it. It's just it's it's to it's to uh, communicate an idea or a concept. 
not not and not literally like we are talking right now. It's more like if you look at a piece of art and you get a message from it that is communicated to you non-verbally, that is more like what some people say their alien writing is about or their communications through this writing. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Yeah. So Very anyway, that, yeah, that's what I think I want to talk about. And it does kind of work into my UFOs as a cosmic art project thing in the way that I just explained to you yeah. where some of these languages are, sure. are are communicating on a nonverbal level or a non, you know, in a, a, a symbolic level that bypasses your conscious awareness. Awesome. So, well, we yeah. really look forward to that. And I'm sure the audience will as well. Again, everybody, that's April 24th. Yeah. And we will let you know what time that will be. As we get a little, we get a little closer. Uh, just so, just stay tuned for like any announcements about that on the podcast feed or YouTube channel. So that yeah. is really, really cool to have you on board and have you start the start the year. We're we're glad to be getting, kind of getting back in gear with that. Uh, we haven't uh, done it in a few months, so since right before the conference. So it's been been a little while. So yeah, thank you for asking me about it because I, yeah. I was. I was thinking of more things to talk about and, you know, changing the talk as I was talking to you because it's, it's sort of notes now. It's not really a talk yet, <laughs> but yeah. it will be when you guys see it. Fresh yeah. material. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I talked to you about that last, uh, last year, but, uh, after the conference, I was just like really tired, but so <laughs> we're getting it started with you this year, Greg. So thank you for doing that with us. Sure. No problem. Cool. I, I will, I will enjoy it. Any chance to do, and I you guys are the same way, any chance to do research on something that I wouldn't normally have when I've got outside <laughs> pressure to do it is welcomed. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's been awesome having you, Greg. I want to thank you for coming on and uh, being a part of the show tonight. Uh, where can people find you and uh, tell them about the books that you have available as well? Well, there's a, a few. Um, wake Up Down There, which is a collection of my magazine or our magazine. My friends Peter and Robert uh, put it together with me in the 90s. Um, uh, Project Beta was after that, which everybody knows about. Um, <laughs> uh uh, Weird California. I wrote about seventy five percent of that. That's still available and in print. Um, just weird, weird stuff in California, um, uh, which is almost a redundant. Uh, uh, a is for Adamski, co-written with uh, Adam Gorightly about the contactee movement or contactees from almost the beginning up to now, um, uh, and it defies language. That's the uh, collection of stuff I wrote online plus some extras. Uh, and of course, the ufology tarot uh, project that we just oh, yeah. finished uh, about a year ago. So that's um, pretty much what's going on now. Uh, and I'm moving ahead. I'm, I'm going to do the alien writing thing for you. And I'm working on a book based on about 200 pages of notes I've been collecting for like the last five or six years. Okay. Well, excellent. Um, thank you so much, Greg. And Guys, uh, stay tuned. We're working on an announcement about the Strange Realities Conference as well. So stay tuned as we kind of finalize plans for that. But uh, if you guys want to hear us, of course, you know, if you're catching us for the first time, it's Paranormal. It's on every platform you could possibly find and uh, also on YouTube. And we have a Patreon as well with some extra content on there. And if you want to support us, Surfio can tell you where to find that. Uh, you can go over to patreon.com slash conspiranormal uh, for everyone on there who joins the mystic crew that gets you into these streaming monthly presentations and there's quite a catalog of those uh, up there as well that you can check out that we did in the past at that tier level uh, that's patreon.com slash conspiranormal all right guys I want to thank you for listening and we will be back uh, in a couple weeks with steve stockton 